Good afternoon. Welcome to McNulty's Book Corral. I'm your host, Thomas McNulty, and today I have an, a special episode for younger viewers, perhaps their parents too, if you guys want to share the vid video with each other. The title of this episode is called How Poetry Can Save Your Life. Now, that's kind of a bold title, um, but I wanted to address the issue of young people uh, or people of any age, really, who are interested in using the creative arts to nurture themselves, to heal themselves, to find ways of expression that they hadn't considered before. And creative writing and writing poetry is one of those that I think works effectively. Now, the best thing that I can do is I can only share my own experience with you. I don't have the answers for everybody. You have to discover that for yourself. Uh, and I'm sure you will. Um, so, you know, what we'll do is I just want to share a little bit about what I've done and the things that have helped me creatively to overcome emotional problems, especially when I was younger in high school and so forth. So let's start there. Uh, you know, when I was in high school, I was bullied and I was also an introvert. I was very shy, very timid. You know, I didn't have a, I didn't have a lot of uh, get up and go. I didn't really want to interact with people too much. So I was kind of a social outcast. That's not uncommon for people of any generation to go through that. Um, and so the way I handled it, and that's all I can do is share my experience was, I began to involve myself in creative writing. Now, obviously I already had an interest in that because I'm an avid reader. And I would start by going to the school library or the library we had in town and I would look up the standard material that you get in high school. Carl Sandburg is always useful to me. Great big book, you know, if you haven't read Carl Sandburg. Now, I'm based in Illinois, so he was an Illinois boy, you know. So Sandburg is there, and, you know, then we have Robert Frost. I think we're all familiar with Robert Frost. I've had this edition, well, both of these editions. I think since the 70s, you know, um, Robert Frost is always a delight. So what happens with me, and I think this happens with a lot of people, is you read a poem that you like, you know, with Robert Frost stopping by woods on a snowy evening, and then you think, oh, that's really cool, and you start writing. That's not unusual. That's okay. Keep doing it. Uh, what benefited me was the fact that I'm an insatiable reader, and I'm constantly seeking books out. So to overcome that timidity and that that fear you know when you're a teenager those are rough years I really involved myself deeply in creative writing and reading uh, and as the time went on you know I began to seek out other anthologies so I think in the 70s I found this one by XJ Kennedy an introduction to poetry third edition I'm sure this book is still out there somewhere excellent overview it has a lot of major poets of the romantics you know byron keats and shelley you can all of these poetry poetry from all ages is worth studying and learning from shakespeare's sonnets and so forth this even has the beatles um and then i found this delightful contemporary american poetry edited by donald hall himself a poet and that is a jasper johns reproduction of a painting on the cover you can google jasper johns and this is really a fantastic book. So I began reading and writing, constantly filling notebooks. And by doing that, I was getting a grip on my emotions, my feelings. And, you know, it's rough at any age. But, you know, especially when you're in high school and if you're being bullied and if you're shy, that's kind of hard. So, you know, and through this, I discovered Allen Ginsberg. And then I read this. Okay, and this is a, a, a game changer here. Now, a few years ago, I read on the internet on a news feed that there was a teacher, and forgive me, I don't know her name, but you can Google this. She took this poem, Allen Ginsberg's Howl, which was probably one of the best poems, you know, anyone's ever written, classic American literature, and she gave it to her students and instructed them to write their own version. And it was like opening the floodgates. So then everybody started writing stream of consciousness. You know, you're not writing to be grammatically correct. You're not writing to put the comma in the right place. When you are first writing creatively, you're just putting it down. You can edit later. And 
reading Allen Ginsberg and teaching Allen Ginsberg's Howl is something that was a watershed moment from what I read for a lot of these students. And that process continues. Other teachers have picked up on that. Read Howl. You know, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, running through the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix. I still remember the opening lines. It's a, it's a stream of consciousness prose poem. Angry, bitter, pointing out the infirmities of the world, the, the injustices of the world, the personal problems, the anguish, the grief. You know, it's all there, and there's hope as well. So you find these things, these elements in great poetry. So I'm Allen Ginsberg's Howl, and again, I came to that through reading this anthology, which had some of Allen Ginsberg's poems and many other wonderful authors. Now, I met Ginsberg years later, and I want to mention this because this is also important. I actually met him twice, and I didn't like him personally one-on-one. -on -one. I didn't like him at all. Uh, but that, you know what? That's okay. Because what I learned from that is that sometimes the people that we put up on a pedestal, one on one, you know, in the, re in the reality of the reality of our lives, that individual, that painter, that actor, that poet, that musician, maybe they're really not the most sociable, friendly people that you'll ever meet in your life, as it was for me with Allen Ginsberg. I didn't like him at all. Uh, I'm not a fan of the man, but I'm a fan of his poetry, and there's a distinction that is very important to be made here. I don't judge a writer, a musician, a painter, an actor based upon their biography. I look at the work that they do. I'm looking at the work. If you have somebody in the public eye that has a, a difficult or unfortunate biography, and many do, that's their problem. It's not my problem. It wasn't my problem that I didn't like Allen Ginsberg. It was really his choice to act the way he did. But I have great admiration and respect for Allen Ginsberg's work as a poet. I will not judge him. I will promote him. He's gone now. And here you have Howell, you know, one of the great works of American literature. Highly recommended. So if you haven't read Howell, you're in for a, a, a shocking treat. All right, so other other poets, you know, there are so many. And, you know, I found this too. I got into everything, you know. I took my bachelor's degree. The Norton Anthology of English Literature, you you get you get Robert Browning in here. You get you know, you, you get uh, Percy Shelley, Byron Keats and Shelley and all the greats are in here. Um, all of that is useful material to look at. I generally write prose poetry myself. I'm not much interested in uh, formula, although I do occasionally use slant rhyme, iambic pentameter, and all that. You can learn about that in school. I'm interested in the raw emotion, getting getting your raw emotion down. So there's the analogy that's been out there is that the page is your canvas. So if you're a painter, this is all you have to work with. This is your canvas. And all you have to do is decide what to put here. So if you're struggling with emotional issues and you don't know, you know, start writing it out. Here's your canvas. Put the anger here. Don't hurt people, you know. Put the anger here. Put the hope here. Put the love here. Put the feelings here. And create, create, and create. It's a lot of fun, and I'm going to give you examples of this. So if you were a painter or a poet, you know, or actors do this by creating a character. Musicians create songs. The blank page is your canvas. It's yours. It belongs to you and to no one else. No one can tell you what to put on that page. It belongs to you. And it's a lot of fun. So let's take a look at, I want to take a look at Dave Vedder. Dave Vedder was a friend of mine. I knew Dave. Uh, and this is a, a chapbook that he did way back in the 70s. And there's a poem in here that really stuck with me over the years and I'm going to read it to you it's called the Prairie River and it's a short you know again you're filling one page all right so that's all you need to do you don't have to write 600 pages you can one one page at a time one poem at a time put those emotions down create something all right so this is called the Prairie River and when I read this it it was just amazing to me that he could write such a beautiful poem 
So here it is. It's, it goes like this. The prairie river possesses a nice piece of the summer sky. It has always been that way. The river pulls the sky down and holds on passionately, one proud lover joining another proud lover. At sunset, the sky sings out of a ruby red throat. The river also sings out of a ruby red throat, taking the sky's great flaming mouth to its broad breast. When darkness comes in the cool green of the evening, when all the river's trees are heavy with the sky's birds, the prairie river and the summer sky get lost in each other, rolling over and over and over on each other. Something very similar to the above also happens in fall, winter, and spring. There could be many river and sky songs written about this. Dave Etter from Crabtree's Woman, a chapbook he did. Dave Etter published widely throughout his life, one of America's great Midwestern poets, a wonderful man, uh, and I, I'm really fond of that poem. So I'm gonna read a couple more from other writers. So Wendell Berry, all right, there's Wendell Berry on the back. Wendell Berry wrote this poem that I'm fond of called The Peace of Wild Things, okay? So it goes like this, and this one is very short. So you see, you're going to fill the canvas with whatever you want. You don't have to write 10 lines. You can write three. You can write five. You can write 20 lines. Whatever you want to fill that page with, that belongs to you. So Wendell Berry made this choice one day. He wrote this poem. All right, Wendell Berry, The Peace of the Wild Things. So this is how he handled the day, The Peace of the Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Wendell Berry, The Peace of the Wild Things. What a beautiful poem. So he's, he's grappling with issues. You know, he's despairing the state of the world, and he put that emotion down. You can do that too. Poetry can change your life. Writing, creative writing can change your life. Creating music, becoming an actor, painting can change your life for the better. Pablo Neruda. So I'm now this poem I'm going to read is another short one. It's not in this book, but I like this book because it's selected poems and it has a really nice picture of Pablo Neruda on it. So this is called Lost in the Forest. Another short one, okay? So filling the canvas of your of your life, filling the blank page of your life with a poem. Lost in the Forest. I broke off a dark twig and lifted its whisper to my thirsty lips. Maybe it was the voice of the rain crying, a cracked bell or a torn heart. Something from far off it seemed, deep and secret to me, hidden by the earth. A shout muffled by huge autumns, by the moist, half-open darkness of the leaves. Wakening from the dreaming forest there, the hazel sprig sang under my tongue. Its drifting fragrance climbed up through my conscious mind, as if suddenly the roots I had left behind cried out to me, the land I had lost with my childhood, and I stopped, wounded by the wandering scent. Pablo Neruda, Lost in the Forest. So these are poems for discussion. What does it mean to you? What do the imagery, imageries evoke in your mind? What are the raw emotions that you feel when you read or hear poetry like that? And what kind of poem can you write today that can help you grapple with ideas and images and emotions that are predominant in your daily life? What can you do with that? So there are some examples. And other writers I like, you know, Frank O'Hara, Lunch Poems, Robert, Robinson Jeffers, Ted Kuzer. I think that along with Along with Allen Ginsberg, A Coney Island of the Mind by Lawrence Ferlinghetti is probably one of the more 
magnificent and famous books of poetry in the last century. I'm really fond of Joy Harjo. She had some horses. She's a Native American writer. She is brilliant, just absolutely brilliant woman. Just fantastic. I just love her poetry. Life Studies and For the Union Dead. This is a double. Robert Lowell, the great poet. These are, you know, just a couple of ideas. That's all I'm throwing out. E.E. E. Cummings, I, you know, I, your teachers will know about E.E. E. Cummings, all right? And, uh, and then the ever popular, always exciting, <laughs> volatile, and sometimes angry, Charles Bukowski, Love is a Dog from Hell, okay? So there's a lot of different types of, of poems for you to, to read about, you know. And Charles Bukowski, if you haven't read him, you have to. I mean, he's, he's a work of art by himself. These are wonderful writers. All of these writers I'm mentioning, they all have a distinctive voice. They all did what I'm, I'm, what I'm recommending that you try to do is what happened today? What emotion is there today? What do you want to, to say? How can you express that? You have that moment right there. This is your canvas. Create something. It can be beautiful. It can be angry. It can be funny. It can be whatever you choose because it's you. It belongs to you. It's your statement for that moment. Now, I'm going to read just a few of my own, um, you know, because it wouldn't be fair if I didn't. I mean, I'm talking about creative writing, and this is what I've done. So here's a poem I wrote many years ago. This goes back to the 70s, and it's called Crosswind, and it goes like this. After she left me for another man, I took the old Plymouth, parked near a damp ravine, headlights tangled in corn stalks, kicked a beer can, bent to the weeds. No prairie angel can save me now. Here in DeKalb County, stars curl off the tongue, my syntax deep with catalpa poems tumbling in walnut shade. I'm caught in a crosswind, lost between neon and leaf, wrapped in the cinnamon mist of prairie, uneasy barns creak in a harvest wind. All right, so I wrote Crosswind after, this goes back to the 70s, after breaking up with a, a young lady that I may have been fond of. So, but you know, you have to, you have to grapple with these issues emotionally as writers, as people, and we need to find ways to to get this down. Now, this is a poem I wrote called Epiphanies of the Heart. And this is about, this is a, a little heavier. This is about a man that lost his son in a recent war and his statement and realizations uh, in handling that. It's very short. All right, it looks like this. So Epiphanies of the Heart goes like this. Six months after they shipped his son's body from Afghanistan, the old man rose early, one fine and quiet morning, warm under the aspens. The sun dappled through the leaves, and he watched an eagle glide in, swoop low and take a fish from the mirrored lake. The water barely rippled. He could see the fish wiggle, a flash like silver, the gills straining, his heart is something like a stone, immobile. But even amongst the afternoon light, his eyes betrayed him. A solitary tear found a trail through the crevices of sun-bleached epidermis, and he hung on to that moment. Much later, sitting in the Black Bear Tavern, his gnarled hand wrapped around a beer glass, he said to himself across the bar and into the mirror, when I saw that eagle, my son would have called that an epiphany. I looked it up. It's a realization. Now I wonder what all that college education means when you're on top of a roadside bomb. Epiphanies of the heart. Dealing with loss. Reflecting on the loss of a son killed in Afghanistan. So again, this can be, this can be whatever you want. I'm going to read one more for today. And uh, this is called 1957 Chevy Bel Air. And excuse me while I do, you know, I need new glasses. Can you tell? So, you know, I'm doing this there, this little thing here. So this is called 1957 Chevy Bel Air. He wrote his first poem of the flesh with her in the back seat and recalled tasting the knee-high orange soda on her lips. 
He would weep decades later at 50 when he learned of her death from ovarian cancer. She was his secret angel, something he kept from everyone, the first girl and always delicious in his memory. Even his beloved wife reminded him when the autumn light tangled in her hair and the funny way she tilted her head, all just feminine mannerisms that made him recall the bell-bottom jeans and flower patch on the left cheek pocket, the Chevy seat springs rustier than his old man, that car rusted away sitting amidst the, an explosion of white sweet clover, dandelions and black-eyed Susan. Something in his heart never let her go. Something of that car clung to his soul like a melody, and he followed time down a long path of remembrance, hoping one day to drive again. 1957 Chevy Bel Air, a reflection on a love affair from the past. So there we have some ideas for poetry. How can poetry save your life? All of the creative arts can save your life. They've been of great joy to me personally. I write all the time, you know, and uh, I never give up on it. Sometimes all you have at the end of the day, and sometimes all you need is that blank page, the canvas, the blank page of your life. You can fill it with whatever you want, whatever choice you make. You can choose, as I said, to fill it with sadness, with joy, with hope, with beauty, with mystery, with whatever 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 is nagging at you whatever is inspiring you whatever love is in your heart whatever hope you have put that on the page now talk to people find people that are like you that think like you that want to do this as well talk to them share your poems back and forth you'll smile when you're done it's going to be good hang in there all right, thank you very much. Stay well, stay happy, feed your brain, and write some poetry. It can save your life.